I'm very pleased to introduce uh, David Kramer, works uh, with Discuss and author of many open source projects that I think we all know. I know his name is certainly all over, all over my requirements text files, but uh, please give him a hand. So uh, I'm going to talk about testing today. Um, most of this is stuff that is kind of takeaways from uh, working at Discuss. Um, who I am, I think a lot of you know of me through various projects, uh, but most importantly, I lead infrastructure at Discuss. Um, that means I basically deal with uh, our databases, scaling out the code, um, the main platform and everything. Um, how many of you know what Discuss is? And how many of you use it? It's pretty good. Um, for those of you who don't, uh, it's basically a commenting widget. Uh, we are more or less installed on every major publisher's site at this point. Uh, it's grown pretty big. Um, these are our current numbers. 30-day um, time period, almost 6 billion page views. This is all powered on Django as well. Um, we also use things like Flask and many other tools at this point. But um, we're still a growing startup. It's less than 20 engineers. Um, we only have two operations people, actually. Um, but we have about 40-some-odd people in the team now. And we are pretty bad at testing. Um, most of us do not come from a background of testing, so all of this has been kind of iteration and improving on like, what we think it should be. Um, and we're trying very hard to be good at it. So this talk comes down to you know, what do we want testing to be, what are the problems that we've had, how have we adopted it, and things like that. Um, and we're going to start with lessons mostly learned. And I say mostly because, as I said, it's still a learning process, and we're, we're trying to get things right continuously. Um, and I don't think any, any of this is really a solved problem. It works differently for every company, for every type of person. Um, the first lesson is no one really likes writing tests. I hate writing them. I love it when they exist and when they run and when they pass. Um, but they're not fun to write. Um, there's a lot of reasons. One is they're time consuming. Um, so you can write simple tests that are quick to write. They're probably not going to test anything. Um, I have an example of this. So we wrote this auto commit middleware to try something a while back. Um, and basically what it does is when there's a post request, it changes to transaction management, whereas on a, any other request, it would be auto commit. Um, it's pretty simple. It's 10 lines of code in this example. Um, the tests, on the other hand, um, we started with some simple unit tests, which were testing very low level. Um, we're using mock to patch this, and we're just instantiating the middleware, and we're asserting that uh, transaction management was called with a true argument. Um, when all was said and done, it was almost 40 lines of tests. Um, there's four logical conditions in here. There's a get request, there's a post request, there's an exception, and then a regular response. Um, so more than half the time was spent writing the tests for this. And a lot of the times, it's even more than that. There's been times where it's taken me like five minutes to fix a bug and several hours to get tests working that actually show it's been fixed. Um, and most importantly, legacy code is very expensive. And legacy, I mean code that's untested or very hard to test. Um, and so we don't even actually bother with testing it um, in the sense that we don't go back and write tests. We had tests for new code, and we had tests for regressions. And the regressions might be in that legacy code, and that's how we eventually gain coverage there. Um, and eventually, you have to pick one in your test. Um, I showed the unit test. It, took me, it didn't take me that long to write, but it was a lot of code to write. Um, and it wasn't very accurate. And I'll explain more why in a minute. So you have to choose one. It's either your tests are going to be fast, they're going to be like those unit tests, or they're going to be accurate. Um, and it comes down to you can spend more time writing them, or you can spend more time running them, or having a machine run them for you. Um, and obviously, we'd rather spend more time running them, because hardware is pretty cheap, and we can just buy more of it. Uh, so going back to this, um, very simple, very obvious what it's doing. Um, I would consider this a unit test. And this is a, a higher level integration test, which takes a lot longer to run. Um, it's very easy to write. And it actually tests what it's doing. It guarantees that it's in a transaction with this helper method that we have. And it sends a proper post request, which goes through the entire middleware chain. Um, so again, it's going to be a lot slower, but it's actually correct. It's actually testing what you're expecting it to test. And it comes down to just unit versus integration tests. Um, so again, the unit test. This is highly truncated to fit on slides. But um, we're patching this specific object, and we're just asserting that it's called once. This is literally the only things that matter in this code. And now we're assuming that that function actually works, which it should. It's probably tested elsewhere. And we're also assuming that we called it correctly. 
And again, the integration test does none of that. It just asserts that it runs in a transaction. It doesn't care how you do it. It just needs to happen. Um, so in the end, you need both of these. I would probably start with full integration tests and then add unit tests for things like regressions. If, I think unit tests are better when the input is variable and you can test literally given this input, here's what I expect. Whereas integration tests is gonna be much easier if you're testing behavior. Um, another big takeaway we've had from trying to adopt more unit testing is mocking is great, but it's very, very fragile. So in this example, again, um, you have to pass a full path to the patch method. And what this does is when you patch it, it returns a new mock object, um, and that's where you can call assertions on and whatnot. Anyways, if the path to the import changes or anything like that, this will no longer function, so you have to update that. If the way you call the method changes, even if it's still correct, so maybe this changed from an argument to a keyword argument, you have to change your test, it's no longer correct. But it is very useful for uh, things like testing external services. If you're calling out to an HTTP service, for example, you can mock the response, and it'll become very fast and still very accurate. Um, and we generally do that. You capture live data, meaning maybe you call out to the Twitter API on your own, you grab the, the JSON or XML that it's returning, and you store that somewhere as a picture. And it might look like this. You take mock, we're still patching um, a Twitter client. I made this up, it doesn't actually work. Um, and this GR is the mock object, and you can just specify a return value, which we're setting to this picture of the Twitter response. And this actually works very well, because APIs really don't change. Um, they might deprecate things, they might release new versions and eventually get rid of old versions, but there's a contract between you and the, you the developer and them the provider of the API that it's gonna be consistent. So this generally works. But that said, you do still need to test life cycles of requests. Um, you can't guarantee that things are gonna work just because it's supposed to work. Um, and this is also why you can't guarantee things are gonna work just because you have a bunch of unit tests that say it works. You need to go from the top level all the way down to some extent. Um, we've done this quite a bit with Selenium in the past. Um, I think we've tried four or five times, and every time we try, we spend a few days or a few weeks on it, and eventually we just disable the Selenium build because it breaks. Uh, it breaks for a number of reasons. Selenium's pretty brittle in the way that you need to handle failing conditions. You basically have timeouts. Um, if the page doesn't respond based on some kind of trigger in 30 seconds, it just fails, and it could be that that triggered the event just didn't fire correctly, or it fired out of order, or something like that. Um, we've actually been switching to PhantomJS for a lot of um, front-end testing now. We don't do a lot of it, but we do a, a bunch of JavaScript testing, and that works very well. Um, so we're considering using that as well for our high-level test. Um, the second op or lesson here is um, don't admit defeat. Um, obviously, it took us a long time to get from, when I joined uh, two and a half years ago or so, we had a reasonable amount of tests. It was pretty low coverage. I mean, I could have said, well, you know what, we're never gonna have great tests. Um, but they've gotten a lot better. Um, and that was by starting with goals. Um, and our first goal was we needed to write testable code. Um, so what I mean by testable code is something that you can actually take a small chunk of the code and test that without impacting the rest of the code because you want your tests to be accurate. And this is a, a good example of some untest untestable code uh, taken from Django. Um, this is the view, or at least was the view, that serves static media. Um, huge function, and all it does is take a path and output a response. But it does a lot of logic in here. And you can imagine why that's hard to test, because no matter what you're testing, you give it an input, and it has to go through all this process that could fail anywhere in here, and then it'll eventually give you an output. So the easy way to make that testable is to break it up. And this is what we do with a lot of our legacy code as we add regression, so we refactor it. Um, so in this, for me, there's three logical components. Like this first chunk here is just taking the path and it's uh, transforming it into a more normalized version. Um, then it's got a little bit of like error handling in here, which is fine to leave in the base function. And then the last one's returning a response from a file. So if you broke that up into three parts, you took the blue ones out and put them into each of their own functions, it's much easier to test. And it gives you very fast tests without breaking the flow of testing the whole thing. Um, so then the second goal is to start writing them. Uh, and the biggest takeaway from this is to make it easy. So I showed in the example that we had this a certain transaction. This isn't a, or at least it wasn't a Jenga thing. I don't know about now. Um, and we took some time to write this, and it's just a simple helper that guarantees that we're in a transactional state. And we know that's correct, and we know we can always use it, and it will always be correct. And we don't have to worry about all the logic that goes into checking that. 
Um, there's a bunch of other things in Django. One of my favorites is like assert num queries. Um, these are things that are already written for you. They'll just wrap context like this, and you can guarantee that you know when I execute this, no queries happen. It's really nice for saying, is the cache being used, or something like that. And now you could do the same thing, and you could mock out the cache, and you could say, was it called, which you probably should, um, because sometimes keys are important, or the query itself is important. But it depends on what you're trying to test. Uh, this second big thing, um, which is by far my favorite, was creating some structure around the test. And what I mean is uh, Django comes, or I'm not sure about the newest versions, but the original way of uh, bundling tests were a test.py inside of your app. So if you're pro it's project.appName uh, slash test.py, right? And that's fine when you have no tests. Um, but eventually, you get a lot more code, and you need to put the test somewhere. What if you have utilities? Where do you put those tests? Um, things like that. And we started where we had a discuss test module inside of it just so the Django stuff would work. And it started filling up basically with like all folders like this. And it was getting really annoying. We had to import all these modules. So we scrapped all of that. And now we have a simple test layout which resembles things like Java and PHP and nearly every other language. Uh, and it's super useful. And it's heavily inspired by Django's test suite. Um, so in this case, top level test directory, which is our project root. So in this, there would also be a top level directory, um, SRC or discuss or something. And then discuss DB annotations is actually a module. And the tests that pi always contain the tests. And we can actually break it down further if we had like a, a complex module with classes or functions. We'll just add more subfolders. Um, and we have several reasons for doing this. Like test discovery becomes very easy. It's also very easy to say test.py is in the same directory, but it becomes much harder to organize it. Um, and it becomes much clearer where all the tests are. Um, another is to document the best practices. I think I'm terrible at documentation. Um, and a lot of people rave about it. And I wish I was better. Um, because every time we actually use it, it turns out really well. Uh, for example, a common thing to do is mock HTTP. So we started adding a lot of snippets, um, cookbooks, whatever you want to call them, to our doc internal documentation. Um, and a common thing is HTTP. And we have our own wrapper because of, uh, we need certain security constraints. And it's just like as simple as saying, here's how you mock HTTP. If you want to make it easier, you could even break this out and create like a with mock HTTP function or something. But it becomes very easy. Then a developer knows where to go. They do it correctly. They do it the same way everywhere. And your tests become much more consistent and reliable. Um, and then lastly of uh, making tests easier is prevent mistakes and do this in an automated fashion as much as possible. This is why we have most of these systems and tools. Um, so we use Nose, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and we also use Django Nose, which is super awesome. And we have a bunch of plugins. Uh, one I wanted to point out here is we have this error in socket whitelist plugin, which guarantees, unless you're doing some hackery with C sockets, that you cannot connect to an external network in our test suite. Before we had that, or actually when we added that, I think half of our test suite failed. Um, now it doesn't. But uh, just add simple things like simple checks and measures. Uh, our third goal is continuous integration, more or less. Um, automate as much as you can. Um, this is probably the best place to start even. Um, you end up something like this. Ideally, you test every commit. There's a build result. It's pass fail. Um, it can be more complex than that. This also records the test results. Um, unless you view them in an interface and whatnot. Um, but the important thing is that it's always happening, and you're always aware of it. And it's very, very important that you make people aware of it and make sure they know that it's there, and ideally require that it's there. So find some way to make sure that it, they cannot go through the system without hitting this. Um, and what our workflow ends up looking like this, um, developer commits, goes through code review, we have the CI server, um, and this ha actually happens in parallel to code review now. Um, and then there's either a, a fail or a pass. If it's a fail, it actually restarts the entire process. Has to go through code review, has to go through integration again after they fix it. Um, then deploy reporting and potentially rollback. Um, so code review is something we adopted uh, maybe a year ago at Discuss. It's now mandatory for every commit. Um, and it's actually very nice. Like The code quality is much better than it used to be. Um, this is a sample review. I'm making a very simple change. I don't even remember what it was. Oh, actually. It, says in here. Um, but it, we end up with things like this at the bottom, uh, coworkers leaving a comment like, oh, maybe we should break this out. We can use it elsewhere. Um, and even though it is not required at all, maybe I decide to go back, even after this is accepted, and break that out and improve our code base as a whole, improve the quality and what else we have there. And something else while we started adopting this um, that we took away was uh, testing throughout the process. 
And this became obvious to us because the code review tool, which I'll talk about in a little bit, actually made it very easy to add more tests. And so we started adding these pre-review pre tests, which are, you could consider this like a pre-commit hook in your Git. And it'll run a limited test suite based on what you've changed. So if I've changed um, the discuss DB annotations module, it'll find all those tests in that parallel directory and it will run those. And that's why that's important for us. Um, and then we go to CI, and then we actually uh, have some smoke tests. We're still expanding on this in production. So when you deploy to a server, it runs tests against that specific server to guarantee certain things. And this is very important if you have like business critical logic. For us, it's a commenting widget. Um, it could be much more critical than that, but we want to make sure that's loading and you can post comments, right? So why not just add a simple test that curls a URL and asserts something's in there? Um, so the biggest part of this um, and the last part is tools. There are a lot of useful tools. Um, we've built quite a few. Um, every one that's useful, I think we've open sourced. Um, I hope that's every tool. But uh, most tools exist to solve your problems. If they don't, build them. Please open source them, but build them. Um, this is how a lot of things have come today. Like uh, Logstash is a big one that's come out recently that a lot of people are using. Um, it's open source. It was built by a company for a specific need. They decided to open source it. Anyways, uh, the first one I want to talk about is Nose. Um, we use this as an alternative to the built-in Django test runner, which is just unit test. Um, unit test two now. Um, there's also PyTest, I believe. I always mix it up if it's test pi or pi test, uh, which is very similar and also good. Um, this is important because it's very extensible. I showed you that list of plugins. And there are plugins for almost everything. And if there aren't, they're very easy to build. It's literally just a class that you inject. And there's a bunch of hooks. Like um, We have one for unit test compatibility. And it just defines methods like want class, want test. And we just do some checks in there. Um, and it comes with a bunch of stuff built in that's super useful for getting started, um, like XML reporting. Um, I have no idea where the standard came from. I assume Java. Um, but you basically need it for any integration system. Uh, you can also drop in a PDB, which is super useful. So if a test fails, you can immediately drop into the PDB at the failure and inspect. It also integrates with coverage.py, which is pretty nice. You don't need it to use coverage.py. Uh, this tool is super, super useful for finding untested code. Now, a lot of people will claim code cover like there's this, what I would say is a fallacy that 100% coverage is not useful. I would say it's very, very useful because that guarantees your code's all getting run, which is the most important thing. Um, so for example, a while back, I was refactoring, um, this is our RESTful API app, and I was refactoring our permissions module, which is down here, and it's like 91% coverage. I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. It's probably all pretty well tested. Um, and I actually drilled into it, and we had this like can write method, and it's a pretty important method. It says, can I write to this, do I have write access to this object? And it was not tested at all. Um, so even though it had 91% coverage, a critical method was not tested. Um, so of course, I had to go back and I had to add tests when I was refactoring this. But that gave me the insight to know that this code I was changing was already, or was not tested well enough. Um, the next item is something else I wrote about two years, two and a half years ago at Discuss. I think it was the first thing I wrote at Discuss. Um, is Sentry. I assume most of you use it. Show of hands. All right. Uh, and it's very important because you're going to mess up. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of errors in our century every single day. Uh, a lot of them are JavaScript errors now, but it's, they're there. Uh, most of you are familiar. It looks like this. It gives you a shiny graph that's somewhat useful. Uh, tries to tell you what's important right now fairly reasonably well. Um, but most importantly, we use this to actually debug things on production and to write tests for. Like, because it gives you so much insight, at least in Python, we can go in here, we can take an error, and we, we can gather enough from the stack trace to know what's erring. And then because we have local variables, for the most part, um, and HTTP information, we can actually reproduce this without ever involving a user or involving like, operations and going into system logs or anything. And that's extremely valuable for us. Um, also, for those of you who have been living in the dark, it does have a JavaScript client now, as well as clients for like every language. Um, so it's pretty nice. Uh, and I talked about continuous integration. I assume most people use Jenkins or Travis CI now. It's super highly integrated with GitHub, which is awesome. Um, and that's this thing on the left in the middle over here. Um, but it actually is quite a few things. So this is the way our build process works. Um, for every project, we have a package step, which 
executes very first. Um, this is kind of a big hack currently. Uh, I know some other people do similar things, but what it does is it creates a virtual env, uh, installs all of our requirements, builds everything in there, tarballs that uh, after it does a little bit of magic, and then it ships it um, to like a build server. Not a build server, but rather um, a file dump, let's call it that. Um, and then every single one of these gets executed after that. We have like performance tests, we have JavaScript tests, um, which are phantom JS. Um, integration and unit are just Python tests. We have them separated just for legacy concerns. Um, and then Selenium, which, like I said, is always disabled. Um, but it makes it very easy because we can now run all these in parallel. Um, I also want to point out, in the past I've talked a lot about this and why we distributed tests this way at the bottom. We broke it up by apps. So this integration is actually another matrix. Um, we did this to make it faster, and it was a simple, dumb way to make it fast. But we've done a lot of work in our test suite, and our test suite actually only takes five minutes to run now for the entire integration and unit test suite, um, which I'm pretty proud of. At one point, it was an hour. Um, the other big thing was code review. We used Fabricator, which was open sourced by Facebook uh, a year ago, maybe. Maybe more, actually, a year and a half. It's a very, very nice tool. It's PHP, but it's awesome PHP. Uh, we've contributed a lot of stuff to it. We've written extensions on it. Many people in the office don't know PHP, and they can still manage to write good PHP using, or with Fabricator. Um, and why we like it is because it's highly integrated with our workflow. We use Git. Um, it has support for Mercurial. I think it even has SVN support. I assume some people still use that. Um, but it's really nice because we get this breakdown. Um, so it has some integration with the commit message that gives you a bunch of things, like uh, issues that it's referencing, but in a structured way. It gives you who the reviewers are, who it actually was reviewed by, um, some other useful things. You can also extend it. Um, but the coolest part is it has this diff command, which is like submit patch. And diff is short for differential, which is their term for a code review. I don't know why. Um, but as I said, we discover tests. And we build a simple extension to do this, um, or to, to do this in this arc diff thing. But we discover these tests, and they automatically run before you can even upload it. It also runs Lint, which for us is like Pep8. It's PyFlakes. Um, we have JavaScript and PHP linters as well. And it's, it's very nice, because this gives you some like reassurance that what you're submitting is OK. And it will not let you get past this if any of this fails. Um, and then it uploads, and it looks like that picture I uh, showed you earlier. Um, so again, we had, uh, you saw the title in there. And all this information in the top, um, barring the unit and Lint, um, where the gold stars are, will actually get recorded inside of uh, the commit message when it's uh, merged in. Um, and then from there, like once it's accepted, there's another command. You just arc land, and it'll do all the squashing and land it as a single commit in master. You can also configure these things. But um, another project which we built um, probably a couple years ago is called Gargoyle. Um, it's very, very good at doing feature flippers, which means you can turn features on, turn features off. You can scale up, or scale out, rather, uh, in the sense that if we have a new feature, um, it could be broken, it could be slow, whatever it is. We can start with like, giving it to like, a portion of our audience. And we use this probably way too much at this point. Um, but it looks like this. Uh, we have a switch. Um, there's conditions. In this case, I'm saying bind, or enable for local host, but disable for my user. Um, like I said, you can also do percentages and stuff. In the, uh, the application code, it ends up looking like this. It's very simple. You call is active on the Gargoyle instance, and you pass it the switch name, and then an arbitrary list of objects. And those objects um, are important, because in this case, if we pass requests, we can bind to users and IP addresses. It knows how to get that. But we could also build it uh, to where we pass other model instances, for example. In our case, we have a website model, uh, which represents like CNN.com, for example. And we'll pass that instance of that model everywhere, because we can have a custom condition set that re is registered. So we can say, instead of enabling it for 1% of users, enable it for 1% of websites. And we can also selectively say, well, disable it for CNN or you know, whatever special case we might have. And we've also actually uh, used this for a few things that were interesting in the past. We launched a real-time product recently, which is just like in the comment widget, there's a, a constant long calling connection open. Um, that talks to some Flask GMS servers. And we had no idea what the capacity needs were going to be for this. So we started out, again, rolling out slowly, you know, 1%, 10%. We'd bump to 50%, and everything would go red. We'd take it back down. And we actually did this before this feature was ever visible to anybody like, in production. It was just like, you would load Discuss, and we would have this other connection running that would, we call it dark time, test this. 
And we've done that for a lot of things since then. It gives us a good idea of capacity testing without having to know anything about capacity testing, which is pretty nice and convenient. Um, something I built two weeks ago, maybe, an open source last week, is called Zumanji. Uh, the name is inspired by one of our interns who just left and was working on the tools that make this possible. Um, we're using it for performance testing right now. Um, and the idea was that it's useful to know when a, a build fails. And we had like a cert query count test for a while, but they were super, like, so brittle that we'd go in and every time there was like a query added or removed, and they would hit different connections, so we'd have to test them all, we'd be like, well, what was that query? We have like a long doc string that would just say, this query is executed, and then this, and then this, and then this. And it was, it was too painful to update. Um, so we're trying to get rid of all those. And the idea here is that, this is kind of hard to see, but it'll run a build. And you would still do this in Jenkins or whatever, your CI server. Um, we have a nose plugin which captures some results. And it'll capture whatever you need. Right now it captures cache, redis, and SQL. And it captures the time taken and the calls, along with everything you could possibly want to know about the call. Um, it does cost a little bit which is why we have that separate performance build. But it's very nice because uh, this is just an example test case in the, the plugin. But you can see down here we have a diff of the calls. And this is everything we've injected. Um, so if you're familiar with New Relic, we kind of have that same timeline view that we built. Um, and in this case, these four cache calls were added. There's three sets and a git in there. And it's really nice because we can now go in and we can be like, well, you know, here's one of the calls. Where is it actually doing it? And it gives us exactly the same thing we'd get in uh, the debugger or in Sentry, and what have you. Um, it's definitely still a work in progress. Um, I kind of have ambitious plans for it that it will replace Jenkins for us. Um, not the build part of it, but the interface. Um, we almost have everything in place that it could. Um, and it gives us, it's, to me, it gives much more reasonable information, and I want that collectively in one spot. Um, so, with all this testing stuff, there's a few takeaways. The biggest one, as I said, like we started really driving this two years ago or so after I joined Discuss. Um, your needs will vary. Um, we had very little need for code review when we were like three people committing code. We had very little need for all this crazy testing infrastructure when there was just a few of us. You know, it's nice now, and it would have been nice then, but it wasn't ready yet. Um, so I think you start with what you need right at the get-go. And I think if you're not using something like Jenkins today to automate your builds, then you should. Um, and it's evolving. Uh, like I said, we do, packaging was one of the examples in our CI app. If you, like, I have a history of talking about this. And if you look back on each of my slides, you'll see that there's like, it's similar content, but it always changes. Like, I'm preaching about something at this point, and now like the next time I talk, I'm like, yeah, this is a better way. It's not necessarily because that was bad, but because at our time, we did not need that, and now we do. Um, and I'm pretty happy with where our process is now. But again, it starts simple, and just add things as you need them. Um, I would say at this point, uh, we have no dedicated person to, manage, or to maintaining our testing and uh, whatnot infrastructures. It's basically like, between me and ops, we maintain this. We could have used a full-time person, I would say, two years ago with the amount of effort we put into this. So it's become super critical for us and super valuable for the company. Um, but I think the hardest part of all of it was uh, getting it adopted in the culture. And we still struggle with this every day. Um, this is why code review has been helpful. Uh, we're, at, like I said, almost 20 engineers. I sometimes forget who people are at this point. Um, so driving it into the culture was a big deal. Uh, we get people that will, they're new and they'll submit like a code review and they won't have tests. Well, maybe we didn't educate them uh, well enough that we require tests for everything. Um, but code review lets us stop that right there. It's not just that it passed tests because it didn't have any tests, but somebody is looking at it and hopefully that somebody is also not new and they know the practices and they're saying, well, you need tests for this or no, these tests actually don't do anything or they're useless or they're incorrect or, you know, Actually, you're not following PEP 8 or whatever it is. Like, we can stop them right there with code review. So that was big for shifting our culture towards this. But we're still struggling with this every day. Um, and in the end, it's going to come down to just writing tests. Like, when I started, there were not tests with every commit. There wasn't even close. Uh, we had maybe 50% coverage. We have 75 to 80% now. Um, there's still a lot of untested code, which is really worrisome whenever you do a refactor. Um, I was trying to rewrite our API, our RESTful API the other day, and by the other, I mean for the last six months. Um, 
And there is quite a bit of untested code. And it just led me to writing more tests, adding more tests to make sure that code was tested, to make sure that I wasn't breaking it. Uh, again, to provide that reassurance that what I was doing wasn't crazy. Um, and when it got into production, or actually, it was in production three times as well. Uh, when it gets into production, um, you actually know it's safe because you have those tests that say it's safe. Um, and that's all I had for content. Um, I want to leave it up to questions. Um, Gargoyle reminds me of an A-B testing framework. Does it also have that idea of data collection in it? It's similar, but it doesn't. Uh, Gargoyle is limited to true and false conditions, and it doesn't collect any data on it. Uh, we're going to work on extending it so that we can actually trace when it's being called at some like sample rate. Um, we have this big issue right now that we have more than 100 switches in it. Um, so not only have we been having to optimize how switch storage works and whatnot, but we also have the issue like, is this switch used anymore? You know, this switch is on 100%. Does it need to exist anymore? So we want to do some collection on that, but I don't think we're ever going to move it towards like an A-B testing um, solution. You have not uh, been talking about testing for performance and uh, how the system react and the uh, load and uh, you have a huge load and sometimes yeah. it's exposed like weird race condition of bugs. Um, race conditions are kind of hard to test. Um, we've done some silly things in the past where we've spun up threads in a test suite and tried to hammer it. Um, that worked. It tested it. Uh, since then, now, whenever we need to test a race condition, we use mock objects and we call a side effect after it's been called like once or we call a sleeper. We do some like hackery in there to make sure the other function gets called when it's in the middle of calling this function. Um, so that way, if there is a race condition, we find it. Um, that said, we've done some stuff to mitigate um, race conditions everywhere in the code base. Um, like we have a bunch of hacks on top of the ORM. Um, for example, every time you do a git or create, uh, that used to be a race condition for us, even though we had unique constraints. Now we actually take out a lock in memcache. We just literally set a key um, that expires in like 10 seconds or whenever we finish, and we do it within there. So we haven't had huge issues with it. That like solved 90% of our problems right there. Um, the performance test, like really, we just wanted to find like O of N queries and things like that, or make sure we're aware that you know somebody added this to a template and it's looping over it, or something bad like that that would really, really impact production. Because it's going to be really hard to get a production-like environment with, like, we have production-like data, but we don't have production-like load in performance tests. So, like, it's, what we're doing is not designed to catch production problems, rather. It's designed to prevent obvious production problems. Um, that said, the stuff that we wrote for the nose test runner, we're considering making it so it's more abstract and we can inject it in production and report those results back into the same system. But that's kind of pie in the sky yet. Um, on the topic of uh, Gargoyle and AB, um, there's actually several AB testing tools for Django. Um, I maintain one now. Um, and we don't use Gargoyle, but we totally should. So we should talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could be kind of specific about how we might be able to um, plan for testing. Like, for example, if I'm starting a brand new project, how, how can I make sure that I include testing and write testable code? Um, so when I'm starting a new project, let's, Zumanji is a good one. That's the most recent thing I've built. Um, it has zero tests. I, I generally just like iterating on the idea at first, um, and then somehow tests grow into it. That said, this is not a business critical product. Um, I think when you start tests, you should start high level, um, very, very high level. Um, critical systems, you don't have to test everything. It would be nice if you had that mentality that you could TDD the world. I cannot. Um, so what I do is I'll go in and Zumanji has like five or six views, right? So I'll just write a test for each view that says, does it load? And that'll be the start to my test. Um, it also has another critical com uh, component that imports a JSON file, which is the results. That would be something I would test much more heavily. And I would decide to test that because I was tired of running it and it failing. And I think that's when you know that tests are needed and they're obvious, is when like, you're continually doing the same thing.
So uh, I use Sentry. It's awesome. Love it. Um, last year after Django Khan, I was inspired to try using Gargoyle because somebody had talked about it in one of the talks. And I ended up not being able to because it used Nexus at the time and was kind of still very much in beta. And I was wondering, um, what the, has that changed? Like, what, what status is it now? Um, I have not committed code to Nexus in quite a while. Um, so I would say it's the same as it was, but it shouldn't be a blocker. Um, I mean, it, it literally is just an abstract uh, thing that sits in your system. It can like inject the admin and things like that, but you sh don't need that. That can be disabled. Um, but yeah, talk to me after. I'd love to know what the problems were. So for the performance testing, I think the key point is the data you're going to use to test, right? So if you want to have production-like data, how do you solve that problem? I mean, there's one way is you random, you random data, and the other way is you use actual production data. Yeah. Um, I would like to just generate data because then it's uh, precise and it will always be the same. Even though if the schema changes, it will evolve with it. Right now, we dump a fixture um, from production databases and we use that. Um, there are annoying things about this that we have to load the fixture and because we need everything, we need Redis, for example, um, it's very, very slow for us to do any of this. It's not like we can just dump like a, a SQL snapshot and load that and be very fast to run. I think it actually takes us like 15 minutes to bootstrap the performance test suite and it's it's painful right now. We haven't uh, come up with a good thing yet, but um, I think the right way is to generate data. And when you load the data, you load all of your production data or no. a subset of it? We're just loading a subset. The goal was to get like edge cases. So we wanted like the smallest cases and the largest cases and get a collection of those things and to be able to run those tests. So like we automate tests for our entire API, or not our entire API, but most of it because it's, um, it's easy easy to program that, right? So we know what all the endpoints look like, and we load a fixture there, and we literally just say, give me like the largest website and the largest like page of comments on the website, and that's what you're gonna use for your fixture in this test. Um, and that's annoying because if that data ever changes, it means our results become inaccurate because the data is not the same and the queries aren't the same and things like that. Um, and that's why I think generation is the uh, key thing there. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. I just wanted to give a little kind of salt promotion. If you are having trouble with fixtures and speed, I'm going to talk about that a little bit tomorrow in Django's nasal passage. So okay. a little more into nose tomorrow. All right. All right. Thank you, guys.